this time we will have a responsive reading, and our McMean family will come to light all four candles, most importantly, the hope candle, leaving only the center of the Advent candle for that beautiful Christmas Eve service that we will have. So if you would, please read with me. Please stand. Hope you can see over the people in front of you. And I will read the white, and you will read the black. It won't be long now. An angel sing. It won't be long now. It won't be long now. It won't be long now. Feasts are shared. It won't be long now. Quiet the rush. Amen. You may be seated. him with us. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie above thy deep and dreamless sleep. The silent stars go by, yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Verse 4. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide in us, our Lord Emmanuel. You may be seated for our announcements. For our announcements this morning, we will delegate that task to Miss Maddie. You ready? Good morning again. <laughs> okay. First up, this is past. So next up. <laughs> okay. The Christmas Eve candlelight service is going to be on Christmas Eve, which is Saturday night at 6.30 p.m., um, according to Diggs, you're welcome to come in your pajamas, So, except for my dad, so feel free to come in pajamas. But that's 6.30 p.m. on December 24th. And the Christmas Day service is going to be Christmas Day, which is Sunday, December 25th at 10.30 a.m. We're not going to be holding any Sunday school. And that's all. There's a couple inserts in your bulletin if you want to look at some dates for, for events coming up. But that's it for announcements, I think. Wow. Wait, what? Oh, the bulletin is wrong. The candlelight, for the candlelight service. So it is at 6.30, not 6. 6.30, not 6. We good? You ready? Hold on, one more. Wait a minute. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I don't think it's on. Um, is it on? Yeah. Okay, David and I have made Christmas ornaments for each and every family to take home today for your home. They'll be on the back table. You make a selection, but if you would, just take one per family so that everybody could get one. I'd hate to have anyone go back there and they're all gone. So just take your one and enjoy your Christmas. We love you all. Amen. We love you. All right, Russell. Come on, do your thing. <laughs> Birthdays. Birthdays. 
going to step on back. If our children would come forward, please, for our children's message. Morning, boys and girls. I've missed y'all. This is my first time to be with y'all since Mr. Mike had his surgery. So I'm glad to be back with y'all. <laughs> Have y'all all heard the story of the, how the Grinch stole Christmas? You saw the movie? I know a lot of you probably haven't read the book or the story, but you have seen the movie. So you know what it's about. Hmm? Good. Good job. So you've seen the movie. Some of you have read the book too. If you remember correctly, um, it was about a story. It was about the people in Whoville, and all of them loved Christmas. They loved Christmas so much. Everybody except the Grinch. And he hated Christmas. He hated Christmas so much that he had plans to go and steal all the people in Whoville's Christmas trees, their Christmas presents, and the food. Isn't that horrible? That's a horrible thing to do. Oh, my. I didn't know about that. <laughs> he did. Okay, well, I didn't know about that either. I just know about what... <laughs> When I was, the few things I've been told, I've never read the story and I've never seen the movie. I've just heard lots about it. Where is he? <laughs> I see you. <laughs> okay. Do you know why the Grinch hated Christmas so much? Because he had a small heart. His heart was too small. He didn't have room enough to have all that love and joy for Christmas or people. Not even Jesus, probably. Huh? No, he had a, a little heart, I think. There's also a new one. Okay, well, we're talking about the old one in this one. <laughs> all right. You know, the Grinch's plan didn't work because the people in Whoville, they knew that it wasn't all about the presents and the decorations and the food. They had big hearts, and they knew that it was all about the love and joy in their hearts. It's not a true story, but I want to tell you a true story this morning about another Grinch, another Grinch who actually tried to steal the joy and the whole Christmas story, actually, his name was Herod, and he was a king. Y'all remember hearing about him? <laughs> 
After Jesus was born, the wise men came from the east, and they went to Jerusalem to ask where the child who had been born to be the king of the Jews. Well, when King Herod found out about this, he told the wise men that as soon as they found him, to come back and let him know where, the, where he was because he wanted to worship them also. He didn't really want to worship Jesus, did he? He wanted to kill him. And that's a horrible, horrible thing to want to kill a baby, your baby Jesus. Why do you think he wanted to kill Jesus? Because he had a, probably a, too small of a heart too. He didn't have that love and joy in his heart. Herod was so selfish that he was scared that Jesus was going to become more popular and more important than he was and probably even take his kingdom. Herod's plan to kill Jesus didn't work either because when the wise men saw baby Jesus and they gave him their gifts, they went back home and they didn't even talk to King Herod. They didn't tell him anything about where Jesus was. Um, an angel had appeared to, to, him, to them and uh, told them about the danger that King Herod was going to, that he had planned. And also an angel came to Joseph and told him about the danger to Mary and Joseph and told, them, told him to take Mary and Joseph to Egypt where they would be safe. So both of those Grinch's plans were failed, weren't they? Yep. They didn't work at all. That's good. So we see that the very first Christmas, even then, a Grinch tried to steal Christmas, and we're so glad that he didn't. The main thing to remember is um, when there, if there's a Grinch trying to steal your joy, just walk away from him and know that you have a big heart full of joy and love, okay? Okay, let's pray. Dear Lord, help us to have love and joy, enough to share with everyone that we know and everyone that we meet, not just at Christmas time, but all year long. Amen. And Mr. Mike's got a treat for y'all. We prepare for our children's Christmas special. And Jennifer, I say thank you for leading and all of those that contributed, Donna. Thank you all for blessing us this morning.
As the kids exit, would you guys stand and sing Silent Night with us? So, now we're going to start. Sing Silent Night, Holy Night, Holy is cold, Holy is bright. verse 3. Silent night, holy night, Son of God, love's pure light, radiant peace from thy holy face. With the dawn of greeting, Silent night, holy night, wondrous song, lend thy light, with the angels let us sing, hallelujah to our King, Christ the Savior is born. 
Please read the Apostles' Creed with me. I believe, Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born on the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you would, if you have a joy or a concern to share, there is a, some stationery in the pew in front of you. And please feel free to add to our prayer list. Uh, we have a, a, a long list of prayers of concerns on the, on the slide. And I know that there are more uh, that, that needed to be added to that. And praise God, we've taken a couple off. So uh, prayers are answered. I ask that you continue to be in prayer uh, for the griders and for all of those uh, in these Christmas seasons uh, one particular family, I will not say the name, but uh, a good friend of mine um, had a tremendous loss last Christmas, and sometimes people need a little help finding joy this time of year uh, based on their life experience. So just lift up uh, all of those in need and even those unspoken prayers this morning. If you would, please bow with me. Heavenly Father, we pray for our church brethren and our sisters, Lord, we pray for all of those in need, those who are here on the slides, Lord, and those who are not. We pray that in this season, those who are freezing will be made warm, those who are hungry will be fed, and that the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, which is His holy church, that we would be at work, we would be ministering the gospel and reaching those in need. Lord Jesus, we also pray for our own family. Again, once again, we lift up the griders. We also lift up all of those in hospitals, those who are sick at home and cannot be in attendance with us this morning. Let your spirit be upon them. Lord, we thank you for our children, for the wonderful sound we heard this morning, the beautiful voices praising God, and we pray that the remainder of this service, our message in the word, our tithes, and our songs of praise will be received in the heights of heaven with welcome and with love. Lord Jesus, let us pray now as you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As our ushers come forward, if you would, please pray with me over our tithes and offerings. Heavenly Father, 
It is you that has cattle on a thousand hills. It, it is you that owns everything in creation. And Lord, we are thankful and grateful for the blessings that you have put on our table. Let us give back unto your kingdom that the gospel may reach the lost. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say, Amen. 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 Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, So this next song we're going to do is a choir special that we've been working on, and it has uh, Christmas music. It's a Christmas song, and it's a call and response. So you'll hear me sing, and then the choir will respond to it. But you're going to know parts of it, and so feel free to sing along with us. I encourage you to do so. Do you feel the world is broken? Do you feel the shadows deepen? 
But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? Do you wish that you could see it all made new? Does the Father truly love us? Yeah. And does the Spirit move among us? Yeah. And does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those he does? Yeah. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? worthy. Amen. Amen. As, as Russell and Laura come up to prepare to bless us with yet another song, and I think Bethany, whoever that is, I want to take you back a couple thousand years. Jesus he is already born, and his mother, her, his mother and his father who know the law of Moses and are following in righteous obedience are taking him in the busy, busy, busy town of Jerusalem. And there at the temple, there are many, many, many people. And there's an older man whose name is Simeon. 
And Simeon is a righteous man of God, and he's there in the temple day in and day out. And the Holy Spirit of God has made a commitment to Simeon that this man will not pass from this earth until he has seen the coming comforter, the Messiah of Israel. So day after day after day he goes, and with him is another. It is a woman named Anna. And Anna is also a very devout Jewish woman. And both of them, on one particular day, have the Holy Spirit thick, thickly laid upon them. And they're there in the temple, and they're doing what they do, and all of a sudden, something feels different. And they turn through the crowd, and they look at this poor couple coming in to follow the righteousness of God and dedicate their son, their firstborn. And Simeon stops. Come here. Let me see. Let me see this child. Oh, Lord. It's him. The question is, what child is this that brings them so much fullness of heart? The question to you is, what child is this that causes such a ruckus in December? It is the Christ child. child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping whom angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch our King
Hej med jer. Please bow with me. Thank you so much, girls. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, bring forth your word, your truth. Lord, light up this room with your spirit. All these songs this morning are just, they're just beautiful, Lord. But even more beautiful is the salvation which you've brought to all of us. Let us confirm with the witnesses in Scripture this morning that Jesus Christ is the Lord, is the Messiah, is our Savior. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Church, I'm going to assume something today, and I've been told that assumption is something that fools do. But I'm going to assume that you know a lot about the Christmas story. And I'm going to ask you, y'all can talk back to the preacher in church, it's okay. It kind of fires us up, actually. So. I'm going to ask you, what do you know about the Christmas story? We know about Mary and Joseph. What else? Anybody willing to do? We know about the Magi, the wise men that came. What else? Shepherds? The baby in a manger? Jesus in a manger? What else? Angels, the star of Bethlehem? I think y'all got it. King Herod. No, we don't like him, do we? King Herod, what else? Y'all know the story. I'm going to leave the nuts and bolts of the Christmas story for our pastor on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. And men and women alike, I challenge you, if you haven't done it every year before, I challenge you in your home with your family, with your children and your grandchildren to crack this book on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day and turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, and to witness the Christmas story to your own family. Is anybody in here that reads the Christmas story every year with their family and their children at church? A couple? I challenge you to do that year, this year. Start a tradition. Man, I hate to tell you this, but do you know who the, the pastor of your family is? And, and ladies as well. Who's the pastor of your home? Is it Kevin? It's you. So this morning, we're going to go a little further back in Luke to chapter 2. And we're going to talk about Simeon and Anna. Now, church, God does things the same way all the time. And Jesus says that he came not to abolish the law of the Old Testament, but to do what? To fulfill it, to complete it. So Jesus, as we read in Scripture today is going to bind himself to the same rules that those in the Old Testament were under as far as the law of God. Now, if you read in Scripture, there's a couple of different places. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. There's also, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about it. If, if someone is bringing a charge against somebody or if somebody is trying to prove a fact is true that something happened that was real, you had to have more than one witness. Anybody ever read that before? How many does the Bible say you have to have? Two or three witnesses. Do you think God goes by his own rules? He does. Now, there are several witnesses of this Christmas story that we know of, but we don't have any words from them. Those we have mentioned, the magi, the shepherds, some of the angels spoke. We have a lot of witnesses to the Christmas story. But the only ones who knew the whole story in the Bible are the ones that were told before he was born. And who was that? Anybody remember who Gabriel talked to? Old Joseph and Mary. So guess who your first witness is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Joseph and Mary in church, they count as one because when a man and a woman come together, they are what? They're your first witness. But the Bible says that if this miraculous birth has happened and this is the child of God, essentially just one witness can't, can't prove truth. You've got to have a couple more. 
And another thing about a court of law, you have to have what I will call reasonable, maybe even righteous witnesses. If I've been a swindler my whole life and I've been uh, carrying out various crimes and frauds and I go before court and I give a testimony, is anybody going to believe me? Probably not. You need someone of righteous character, righteous faith, preferably in the Old Testament, someone who is Hebrew and Jewish and dedicated to the laws of God. That will be Simeon and that will be Anna. Two very godless people. I've talked enough. Let's get in the Word. This is chapter 2, verse 21. When the eight days were completed for his circumcision, he was named Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived. And when the days of their purification, according to the law of Moses, were finished, they, being his parents, brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, just as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male will be dedicated to the Lord. Now I'll stop there for a moment. A couple of things. Number one, this is not talking about priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. That's another, that's another clan. That's the Levites. This is just talking about the firstborn in the Old Testament, what God made the law for the, for the Israelites. The firstborn had to be dedicated to God with a sacrifice. Now Mary and Joseph, they were poor. This also attributes to when the Magi came, because if when the Magi came, were Mary and Joseph poor anymore? No. They brought up, what'd they bring? I guess it's golden myrrh. But at this point, the Magi have not showed up. So they're following the law of God, and they're going to the temple, and if they had had any money, they would have brought a ram to sacrifice to dedicate Christ to the Lord. But they don't, so they bring two doves. Now, church, there's another thing here that's pretty important that I don't want us to miss in this part of the story. Jesus says here on the eighth day, what happened? It says that he was circumcised. Now, church, there's a lot of theories on circumcision, New and Old Testament. But one of the main reasons that God did that was to remind parents that they gave birth to a sinner. Now, Jesus was not a sinner, but guess what? What did the law say to do? The law said on the eighth day, that boy will be circumcised. You say, why would God put a law in place to remind a new father and a new mother that their child was born a sinner? It's a good question. Y'all ever held a new baby in all their purity and all their sweetness? Circumcision was essentially a reminder that that baby, too, would need a savior. And therefore, the law was put in place that circumcision would mark him as a child of God. Now, Jesus did not need cleansing. But he was not there to abolish the law, but to what? Fulfill the law. And you say, well, preacher, that makes sense, but why'd they do it if they didn't need it? Because God said to Now, there's another place in Scripture where we see the same thing in the New Testament. What did Jesus do? Y'all remember the dove coming down and God saying, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. What was that about? Baptism, right? The cleansing, basically with John the Baptist in his day, marking the cleansing of the soul. Jesus, did Jesus need to be baptized or cleansed? No. But... He was doing what? He was trying to basically pursue all righteousness. He was setting a new rule to follow him in baptism. Church, that's important because a lot of people say he wasn't perfect or he wouldn't have been circumcised. He was following the law of God. In the New Testament church, we we mark ourselves for God and it's a different way. It's a spiritual way, but it's an example that Jesus set by being baptized and that God, the, the Holy Spirit, essentially confirmed By showing up as a dove. And you remember hearing the great voice of God the Father. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. And Jesus said, I'm doing this to pursue all righteousness. The circumcision was for the same reason. He said, well, that's the point of your, your, your story, preacher. No, it's not, but it's important. It's important. It's important for someone here. I'm going a tangent because i got a little bit of time. Baptism is very dear to my heart. To mark your soul... 
to really mark their flesh, essentially, for the kingdom of God. An outward sign of an inward change. I remember Jack Fitzgerald best. I remember a really good man, one of the best sense of humors I've ever met, 98 years old, wheelchair bound, coming to me and telling me he'd run, and, he'd run long enough. He'd been supposedly going to be baptized two or three times, but he didn't show up. Now he's 98 and he's in a wheelchair. Was he 96? He's in a wheelchair and he comes up to the front of the church and he says, Preacher, you got me this morning. He said, My toes don't have any feeling yet. You've been dancing on them. I want you to baptize me in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know the coolest part of that? The day that Jack was baptized, now, this was not a Methodist church, guys. I was, I was a heathen Baptist back then. Don't judge me. But the day that he was baptized, the men rolled him up to the stairs to come up and come into the baptistry. And they began to help him up. And he goes, no. God's prepared me for this. And I watched that old man climb them stairs with no help. He'd climb right back down in the water with no help. And we baptized him in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Turned around and he went, boy, he went up them stairs fast the second time to get out. I think for two reasons. Number one, he was excited. Number two, because the water was cold. But either, either way, he got up there. Jesus does these things in his own life to show us what we need to do. Circumcision, baptism are two of those things. So Mary and Joseph, like true Godly people devout, they know that their child is the Son of God. The angel has already proclaimed it. Joseph has seen this woman who's not known a man get pregnant and bear a child, and all the people show up at the Christmas scene, and, and he's, he's seeing God moving. So as time goes by, uh, yes, I'm going to take my boy to the temple, and yes, I'm going to dedicate him like I'm supposed to according to the Word of God. And Mary, we can't, afford a, uh, we can't afford a ram, but the Bible says, if you, if you read the Old Testament, the Bible says that we can take a couple of doves instead because we don't have the money for a ram. So let's get them and let's go. And it says here in the law, and they go to offer a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout. We've been studying in Sunday school in the mornings that God recognized Abraham's faith as righteousness. This man was righteous, this man was faithful, and he was devout. Looking forward to Israel's consolation and the Holy Spirit was on him. Now church, when we talk about Israel's consolation... They'd been through a lot. We're talking about Israel's comforter. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Boy, that's a blessing right there, isn't it? You're going to see the Savior of the world before you die. Guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple... And when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to perform for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him up in his arms and praised God. I wrote here in my Bible, how cool was that? I want you to think of this old man coming up to the church and he, he may be shuffling along and he's old, he's waiting for the Messiah, he's been waiting and waiting and waiting and there's all these people and like I said, something feels different. Maybe he's a little excited, and then he sees the Lord. He sees Mary and Joseph coming in, and you got to remember they'd gone to Egypt, they'd come, they'd been, they'd been through some stuff. He sees them. If they're like me, they were kind of corny. Anybody? Does your voice elevate when you see babies? I do that. Oh, look, he's there. Can I hold him? I can't. Oh, come here. Come here, little guy. Oh, what are you doing? Look at you. I have seen him. 
God is good. Look what he's given to us. He's faithful. He's true. I mean, can you imagine holding baby? Man, there's a, there's a play I used to do. This. He's, I talk about how all these people that saw baby Jesus, they were holding him, but he was really holding them. I imagine you felt something powerful when you held that child. But Simeon says it different. He takes the baby and he raises him up. And he says, now, anybody seen the Lion King? Remember how he, they hold up little Simba? I think of that. Hold Jesus up. He says, now, master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised. For my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples. And he says, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. Now guys, those Jews didn't care much about Gentiles. And this man's quoting directly from the prophet Isaiah. Talking about a light. It's in there about nine times that a light has come into the world. In church, he's serving as a righteous, godly witness that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord of heaven and Lord of earth. Verse 33 says his father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. I kind of think they maybe shouldn't have been. They'd already talked to angels, right? What's, a, what's an old fellow at the temple? But nonetheless, they were. Then Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary, Indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed, meaning that the world would come against this child. And then he gives Mary a foreshadowing in Scripture. See, have any of you ever heard this part of the Christmas story? If you haven't, it's okay. This is huge, church. This is huge about your faith. He gives Mary a warning, a foreshadowing. He says, and a sword will pierce your own soul. Saying, dear mother, you will hurt because of this child. You think Mary hurt at the cross? Yes, yes. Her heart broke. There's one pain in human life that is not natural, and that is for a parent to bury a child. It's not natural. That's not the way that it's designed to go. And Simeon tells Mary, a a sword will pierce your very own soul. And he says, but the reason is that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now, church, that is one of the most important scriptures in the Bible. He says this child will die as a sacrifice, and it will hurt the mother, which is Mary, but it will happen that the thoughts, that means the inner workings of the mind, The ideology, the beliefs of many hearts. I'm going to call your heart that cluster of emotions you call a soul. The you that won't even have a body or clothes or anything. You're the core of your being. Jesus died that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed or made known. Pastor, what does that mean? It is with your heart that you receive and you accept the Lord as your Savior. Amen? And it is with your mouth that you confess that He is your Lord and your Savior. And Simeon is telling Mary what will happen to this child at the cross will happen so that the belief, so that the faith so that the acceptance, so that the surrender of the believers in Jesus Christ across 
generations will be revealed in the presence of God. And though those people messed up in life, they knew your son. That's why he's going to die. So that what those people believe, not what they say, but what they believe, a thought on the inside of someone's heart and their soul, that it will be revealed before the Father. Amen? That's beautiful stuff. That's deep. You want to get deep in the Bible? This is a verse that people overlook years and years and years and years. I promise this part of the Christmas story is missed. That what someone believes in the core of their being would be revealed because of the Christ child. Now church, there's another side to that coin. It's not just those who believe whose thoughts will be revealed, but also those who do not believe. Those who have not accepted Christ. Church, I ask you this morning, before we get into Anna, her testimony, this witness, Simeon, he's told us a great thing about this child. This is the real deal. This is Jesus. He knew what child that was. Church, I ask you, what child is this? What is he to you? Is he just a pretty picture on a stained glass wall? Or is he real? Do you believe in his power and in his name? and his strength, and his glory, and in his salvation. What child is this? There was also a prophetess, Anna, a daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was well along in years, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and was a widow for 84 years. Y'all ever met those women and they're strong, they're strong. Everyone I've ever met that falls into this category, but they fell in love with a man, they married a man, they committed their life to the man, they had children with that man, and then he passed away. Nobody wants to be alone, but in this case, this is a woman so strong that all, she never remarried. She was all about God's business. She just, I'm going to stay single. He was my love. He was my love. A lot of times, we get, especially when we get older, we get remarried for companionship. And that's okay. Till, till what do we part? Till death do we part. But in this case, I just want you to see her strength. She's righteous. She's in the, about the temple business. She's a holy lady. She's a woman of God. And she's that kind of woman that don't need nobody. She can do it on her own. Does that make sense? Tough gal. 84 years, she's by herself. It says she did not leave the temple, serving God day and night with fasting and prayers. And at the very moment, she came up and began to thank God and to speak about him to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. She's going to see something very special. What do you all think she sees? She sees a baby. She also proclaims that this baby is the Son of God. Church, I'm out of time, but I want to close on this. What child is this? What role does Jesus have in your life? Is he a box you check on Sunday? Or is he your Lord of your life? Do you walk with him? Do you have a relationship with him? Do you pray? Do you teach your children about living godly and righteous lives? Do you try to progress to be more like him? Church, is he relevant in your life? Are you obedient? Do you love the Father? Have you followed in baptism? Church, there's one decision that matters more than anything else you'll ever do in life, more than the house you buy, more than the person that you marry, more than whether you spank your kid or ground them. There's one decision that matters the most, 
And that is who Jesus is to you. Amen? We're going to move to our invitation this morning. And and I want to say, you don't have to come forward because that's not fun. Nobody likes to come forward. This is an altar, church. You got something on your heart? This This is where you leave it. This is where you bring it. And this is where you lay it down. Now, this morning, you're going to be probably eating some plants if you do that, but I want to invite you. The altar is open. Let us not be a church that is scared to come on our knees to our God. And who cares what the person next to you thinks or why they think you're there? You're here for Jesus, not for you and not for them. But as you stand this morning, as as we sing our closing hymns, I want to ask you, are you right with the Lord? Are you right with that child? Is he your born Messiah or just another baby? Is Jesus a big deal or is he the only deal that matters? He longs to have a relationship with you. He longs to love you. He longs to save you. And church, he longs to bring you home. Amen? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We lean on you. We know who you are. And we know that Christ the Son in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with John. No, excuse me. The Word was with God, and the Word was God, as John the Apostle says. We know the eternal essence of Christ, and we know that he poured himself out into the child, the incarnate child, to die that we may live. Lord Jesus, this morning we say thank you, We say we love you, and we say Merry Christmas. And all God's people say together, Amen. Please stand. Sing with us. The first Noel did say was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay in fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep no this benediction and pray with me go forth this week as the people of God let the Christmas spirit be upon you and men and women let the Bible let the story of the birth of Christ be read aloud from scripture in your home lead your family to know the story of glory go forth as the people of God and God be with you and all God's people say together Amen. Sing with us as we leave. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing.